Hi, everyone, and welcome to our session on embodied carbon and envelopes. On behalf of the Boston Society of Architecture, thank you for joining the fourth session of Embodied Carbon 101, the BSA's 12-part program series taking place this summer. Following up on the Embodied Carbon in Buildings Conference that the BSA presented in 2019, this series will bring you embodied carbon programming and uh, almost every Monday, providing foundational knowledge in different impact areas and giving you tools and takeaways that you can apply to your everyday work. I'm Melanie Silver, a building scientist at Payette, a Boston-based architecture firm specializing in healthcare and higher education facilities. I'm pleased to be joined today by Christopher Nielsen, an architect at Bruner Cott, an architecture firm also based in Boston, whose work includes cultural and education projects, adaptive reuse, and sustainability as well as Chris O'Hara, a founding principal of Studio NYL, a Colorado-based structural engineering and facade design studio with offices in Boston and Minneapolis. Chris and Studio NYL are members of the Carbon Leadership Forum and signatories to the Structural Engineers 2050 Challenge and AAA's 2030 Challenge, as well as Catherine Paplin, Senior Building and Closure Consultant at Stephen Winter Associates, which is a research consulting and advisory services firm specializing in energy, sustainability, and accessibility. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for this series, Arcwoods and Services, Goody Clancy, Huber Engineered Woods, Kingspan, Nordic Structures, Select Building Products, and Thoughtforms. We're grateful for your support. And thanks also to our, to our partners, the Associated General Contractors of Massachusetts, Built Environment Plus, and the Structural Engineering Institute. I'd also like to recognize that this program series is supported by the Carbon Leadership Forum and its local knowledge community, CLF Boston, which we invite you to join if you are interested. Before we dive in, just a couple of notes about this program. There's one learning unit in health, safety, and welfare is available to those who are eligible. We will share a link to a Google form in the chat box. And if you want continuing education credit, please add your name, email address, and AIA number there. And if you are not an AIA member, but you want a certificate, please enter your name and email address in the same form. We are recording this session, and it will be posted to the BSA website, architects.org, later this week for you to access. This is our agenda for the day, and we ask that you share any questions using the Q&A function. And while we might not be able to address all of them today, we will use them to inform the future programming. And additionally, we will stay on the Zoom session for a few extra minutes after the hour as well to get to a few additional questions if you would like to hang around. So let's dive in. And I just want to start with the brief reminder of why embodied carbon is so important. Hopefully you all saw the first session that showed this graph from the IPCC report. This shows a projection of global temperature change for different carbon emission pathways. The red horizontal line represents two degrees Celsius of temperature increase, which is the point where we can avoid the most catastrophic changes. The only scenario that meets this target is to be zero carbon by 2050. And to meet that goal, carbon emissions must dramatically decrease by the year 2030. So we really have 10 years to make a big difference and we call this the time value of carbon. Another way to represent similar data is with this graphic from Ed Hawkins and Alex Radke from the Show Your Stripes campaign. This illustrates various climate action scenarios and the resultant temperature change. And from here, we can see that even with that most optimistic scenario, that there's a, quite a bit of temperature change from pre-industrial times. So this really shows that we need to address this issue of embodied carbon now. After last week's great session on structures, today we're focusing on the envelope and envelopes account for a significant portion of the total embodied carbon in a building. Uh, it is important to note in this graph that the slices of the pie can vary greatly depending on the type of your project, but this does help us to focus on tackling these large areas for reduction and does show that envelope is still pretty significant. And envelopes as well are unique that in addition to the initial embodied carbon, their design will affect the operational carbon over time. And it is important to consider in design as the use of materials needs to balance both of these objectives. However, as we make higher performance buildings, the performance, um, the, the embodied carbon proportionally grows and it becomes more significant 
um, for these higher performance projects. And additionally, if we consider the time value of carbon, which is the next 10 years, then the proportion of embodied carbon emissions becomes even greater. So at Payette, we have been using Kieran Timberlake's tally tool to research the difference in embodied carbon for facade materials. Across the various systems we studied, the impact of embodied carbon varies greatly. Uh, you can see that in this graph here. While lifespan and durability of materials differ and is important to consider, uh, this graph is showing these systems with only the 10 year lifespan. This is taking into consideration the time value of carbon from now until 2030. And these systems have all been analyzed using the same R value to ensure that they are an apples to apples comparison. We can take that same data and we can break down the systems to see which parts are contributing the most to embodied carbon. The red here is the exterior finish, while the blue is the support system and yellow is the insulation. The proportion of each color varies greatly within each system and it shows us how we can start to optimize each one. For example, if we see this first bar here is a four inch granite masonry veneer system, uh, and you can see it has a really high embodied carbon. But if we switch the design to a granite rain screen, we can reduce that embodied carbon of the envelope by more than half while still maintaining a similar aesthetic. Payette is developing a web-based tool that will make all this data publicly available. And we hope that this will enable embodied carbon to enter the conversation much earlier in design. So keep your eye out for our launch later this summer. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speakers who will dig deeper into all the nuances that I briefly touched on for the embodied carbon envelopes. All right. Take it away, Catherine. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Welcome. Um, my focus today is insulation in the building enclosure and related to embodied carbon. And uh, I begin with the reminder that the carbon clock is ticking, which means that there is a finite amount of carbon in the atmosphere right now and a finite amount more that the atmosphere can hold before triggering a cascading chain of catastrophic events. Therefore, numerical accuracy is key to minimizing and avoiding emissions in order to flatten and reverse the carbon curve. Um, and uh, we, I hope I can, you can see, we are here. Um, so insulation occupies a unique position at the intersection of embodied and operational carbon emissions. It has the capacity to pay back embodied carbon debt racked up in manufacture and construction with avoided emissions during a building's operational uh, lifetime. My uh, cartoon diagram here shows that insulation mediates between the exterior uh, cladding and the uh, interior finishes in the building wall and um, it can be on both sides of the air and water barrier or it could be the air uh, and water barrier. Um, everyone thinks of insulation as primarily providing thermal resistance, um, i.e. it slows down the flow of heat uh, through the building enclosure, but actually it has many more purposes in the modern envelope than people generally realize. I count more than 10 for each of the basic enclosure assemblies, uh, that is the wall, the roof, and foundation. For the exterior wall, these include the air seal, uh, the air barrier, air water barrier, condensation control, vapor barrier, fire resistance, protection board, and acoustic dampening. And you can have any combination of, of, of these things uh, uh, that, uh, that insulation may be doing in a particular uh, portion of the enclosure. When you move around to the roof, you have uh, these and you also uh, should add in a uh, building slope. Um, uh, in other words, uh, roof, uh, sorry, roof slope to drain, uh, tapered insulation. 
uh, when you move around to the, uh, the foundation, uh, you should add in uh, the resistance to hydrostatic pressure, uh, which is a, a very tricky thing indeed. And uh, there are only a few uh, uh, plastic insulations that are uh, capable of doing it. So <clears throat> uh, I'm dividing insulation into three overall categories by base material. Um, since the type of material generally corresponds to the level of embodied carbon uh, in the material. First, we have the biogenic materials, um, uh, which are, uh, and among more common of those are cellulose, uh, that's loose or dense pack, cotton denim, uh, wood fiberboard. Uh, they're of a wide variety and there are more being developed. Second are the uh, mineral-based insulations, chiefly um, mineral fiber, mineral wool, uh, which could be in uh, loose fill, bat, semi-rigid or dense board form, and uh, also fiberglass bat. Uh, finally, we have uh, polymeric or plastic installations, uh, including uh, closed and open cell polyurethane, um, sorry, polyurethane foam, uh, known as SPF, Extruded polystyrene board, known as XPS, polyisocyanurate board, um, expanded polystyrene uh, styrene board, which is EPS, and you'll know. And uh, so there's quite a number, and they all do different things. Um, question on everybody's lips is typically: Is this good insulation or is this a bad insulation? In my view, this is the wrong question because it takes insulation out of the context of the multiple purposes it serves in the envelope and ignores the potential for payback from avoided operational emissions. And it also ignores the scale of embodied carbon emissions, I'm sorry, emissions within, with respect to the embodied carbon of the building as a whole. Many in the sustainable construction field adhere to the notion that biogenic is good because generally these materials have lower embodied carbon and even have the potential to be carbon negative uh, by virtue of carbon sequestering uh, materials. Mineral wool has become very popular because it's natural and fire resistant and has several other excellent qualities depending on type and use. Plastic insulations have be been given uh, the bad label more and more often because they are petroleum products and some of them have high embodied carbon not to mention issues of toxicity, release of uh, gases over time, flammability, etc. In reality, in reality, um, each material has appropriate uses. Each material has appropriate uses and appropriate scales of use that can make it the right choice for a product project and also uh, liabilities and limitations that make it the wrong choice for a project. In general, by, uh, here we go. Now, um, when we get down to what the embodied carbon value of any particular insulation material is, in general, we're going to find that biogenic insulations have the lowest embodied carbon, uh, but they also tend to have the lowest R value. Mineral insulations occupy the middle ground uh, for both embodied carbon and R value. Polymeric insulations uh, tend to occupy sort of the middle to high ground. Um, so um, you also have to realize then that the highest R values um, are, on, are only found among the plastic insulations. And uh, what I point out here with the two graphs is that uh, the one on the left is uh, actually pre presenting a more nuanced uh, view of uh, because it's giving you many more different forms of, of uh, let's say rock wool, for example. Um, and then the, the uh, recommendations that go with it are, are trying to help you make judgment calls based on that information. The one on the right, um, there, there is much less specificity and about materials. So all materials are kind of all lumped into, into one. And, um, and the recommendations that go with this are of the order of this is, um, you should avoid using this and you should use that. So um, now when we talk about uh, the payback of carbon debt, uh, I'm gonna focus on two outliers of uh, among the installations and that is um, closed cell spray foam uh, 
uh, and uh, XPS, uh, extruded polystyrene board, because both of those have extremely high embodied carbon uh, because uh, typically because of the blowing agents that have been used, uh, HFC blowing agents that are used with them. Um, and uh, on the left, you uh, talking about a, a study that was done uh, by Building Green with the help of uh, John Straub, Dr. John Straub, uh, that, that talks about adding insulation to an existing wall and finding that uh, you had uh, upwards of 30 year payback time per inch for, uh, to pay back the embodied carbon of the insulation you were adding. Um, it, it's the basis of this as adding to an already existing wall uh, doesn't make it directly comparable to um, to other situations. It's a it's a specific kind of situation. A uh, more recent uh, Dupont study, uh, um, uh, taught by uh, Dr. Michael uh, Michael Porter of uh, Dupont, um, simply uh, uh, takes takes a, a wall with no insulation in it and compares that to uh, what would happen in avoided emissions when you when you add that insulation and um, and comes up with payback times in months and years. So I think the point here is that we, we need to really standardize our models, what they're based on, and uh, in order to have a true understanding of what payback time really is for any particular material. Uh, the good news here is that HFCs are being phased out. Uh, there is now an HFO blowing agent, which uh, uh, is being used in closed cell spray foam. Um, and it has a, a GWP of, of less than one. Um, it's available from Demolec and Isonine. Um, and there is also coming up uh, lower blowing, uh, lower GWP blowing agents from DuPont and Owens Corning. Uh, for for uh, extruded polystyrene board insulation, and they'll be uh, available uh, starting in January of uh, 2021. Um, this actually is um, largely the explanation for why you get such high numbers with the earlier uh, study that I showed you uh, by Building Cream. Um, and so this is this is all about uh, the diminishing marginal returns of adding every few inches of insulation. Uh, so so uh, I'm not going to go too deeply into that, but that's an important concept to understand because it has implications directly for the cost, the embodied carbon cost of the thickness of insulation you're using. Um, and, and as well as, frankly, the other costs and implications of it. Um, so I'm going to uh, wrap up by saying that um, we we really need to take a holistic view uh, of of uh, of the insulation within the whole building context, and um, you have to understand the scale and purpose of the insulation within the product uh, within the project and what the trade offs are. And existing building retrofits uh, uh, offer enormous uh, embodied carbon savings and opportunities. So there, especially, what you do with insulation is going to be uh, really critical. And and um, the embodied carbon of the insulation itself uh, is probably going to be the least of it. Um, some other things to look at is is really that ultimately every type of insulation will have an appropriate use uh, and, and, a, 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 and an appropriate scale uh, that it can be used at when it may really be the best choice for a product project. And that's what you want. You want the choice that is going to result in the lowest uh, emissions and the most avoided emissions. And it's, and, and, uh, so you have to understand in depth what each of the trade-offs involved in each type of in insulation in order to be able to get there. And then finally, um, uh, we need data. 
uh, we need standardized comparable EPDs, we need independent review, and to my mind, actually, most of all, we need case studies. Um, and and double, double that, we need case studies for existing building reuse. And, uh, and uh, we all, I think, uh, need to incorporate LCA in some form into our practices uh, uh, overall. And uh, there we go. That's my tour of insulation. All right, I'm Chris O'Hara. I'm going to be moving into the next phase of Embodied Carbon uh, 101 talk for all of us. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen right now. So I'm going to build off of what Melanie and Catherine have done and really coming back to what Melanie showed in all those graphs of the varying embodied carbon of the different wall assemblies and maybe look at some opportunities to fine tune in. I think the uh, different material choices are pretty clear in terms of the embodied carbon of different materials and be able to get the EPDs to really uh, sort through that. But as we look at the rest of the wall assembly, that blue zone that she showed of the structure within the system is critical. And actually in that graph, the structure that is inboard of the weather barrier wasn't even really um, accounted for in there. So as you look at you know, the basic wall assemblies, there's a lot of opportunity to fine tune this. I think starting with a CMU assembly is pretty clear. Having a cement-based product is not ideal from an embodied carbon. If you've been on any of the other talk where cement is one of the big evils of embodied carbon. But there is always a time and a place for this assembly. And it really needs to be looked at holistically with your building. So for buildings that need a high level of durability, uh, such as like an auditorium or maybe a heavy mechanical or industrial area, the CMU may be appropriate. And then there's other benefits like fire, um, performance and thermal mass that need to be considered holistically in your LCA. Coming back to maybe what we're seeing in more of our uh, larger buildings more conventionally is going to be more of a light gauge assembly system. And one of the challenges we run into is the way we've kind of delegated out a lot of our responsibilities, design professionals using delegated design, is we started developing specifications where we're allowing the contractor to make use of their tradecraft and skill and preferred methods to develop these systems. But what ends up happening oftentimes, they end up a little over-designed and uh, not really tuned necessarily to the exact amount of material needed. And when we're doing this, try to keep an understanding that going from a 16 gauge stud to an 18 gauge stud is a 27% savings. And many times a lot of our cladding manufacturers for their rain screens are requesting a substrate of 16 gauge, even if they don't really need it. So doing a little extra study to really tune the facade of exactly what gauge material is already a huge change in the amount of material in our facade system. And then we also need to consider what are our finishes, whereas a brittle finish uh, material is going to require a much stiffer substructure to support it to prevent cracking. Whereas if we're able to do something a little bit more flexible, we can probably use less material to support that and the yeah, fairly obvious of heavy cladding versus light cladding. And the other thing I want to mention is thermal breaks should really be intermittent when used. Um, using a continuous smart CI or something like that is better than the alternative of metal, but if we use them intermittently, we'll have less of that material and more real insulation in that zone. And as we move into you know, the hopeful savior of carbon positivity, CLT, there are a lot of challenges that actually come with this as well. Uh, CLT is an inherently moisture sensitive material. So when we're building these buildings, even during construction, we have to almost have temporary roofs over the building to protect that CLT during construction. Now, one of the major benefits is uh, the modularity and the speed of construction that go with it. And one of the things that's often not seen or considered in the cost is that we can fasten anywhere. We're not really looking for stud finders anymore. We have a substrate that is suitable for fastening cladding everywhere. But as we get back to the moisture, you're looking at a couple of woofy diagrams here where the, uh, the purple is the dew point temperature and the red is the uh, atmospheric taken over usually a three year period of historical data. And as long as those uh, two graphs are separated, we're in good shape in terms of moisture infiltration, as you can see on the left. But as you move to the image on the right, and you see the overlapping, there we're starting to get condensation potential. Now sometimes a subtle amount of overlap of those graphs can be accepted uh, based on the drying potential, the materials and the durability you're using. But when you're getting into CLT, uh, you really need to be careful on it. And as much as your base wall assembly may be just fine, when you get into transitions to glazing systems or a transition to a terrace or um, a 
shade structure or even signage, we can start to get some thermal integration that we need to be really careful about, make sure we're analyzing our systems appropriately. And we talked about that modularity being an advantage, but sometimes panelization can have a bit of a detriment when it comes to carbon. As much as it's great for speed, site constraints, and uh, quality control, oftentimes the marriage joints of these panels are what we need to make them um, truckable and liftable, add additional material to it that needs to be um, considered in our carbon assessment of these uh, systems. Not to mention the marriage joints are often affecting our operational carbon in that they have a little bit of uh, a ther harder thermal bridge to manage than we would get in a stick built system. As we move into glass, uh, the, in, the end of life is really a big issue for glass that we use in buildings. Now the float glass that comes right off the line is extremely recyclable. The challenge is once we start assembling it into usable products by heat strengthening it, coating it, laminating it, building it in IGUs, we start adding impurities that make it harder and harder to um, reuse that glass or try to re recycle that glass. Even older glass from projects that is monolithic before we actually insulated buildings properly um, has a much higher um, iron content than our modern float glass has and as a result can't really be used. So as we start looking at the glass, what are other things we can use, think about in terms of its performance? One of the go-tos in high performance buildings are triple glaze assemblies. These of course um, have one extra light of glass and therefore a little bit more embodied carbon since there is high embodied carbon content of the glass. And that comes into roughly 22% uh, of the embodied carbon of that unit. But um, when we look at the payback, a lot of the studies are showing it as a 20 year payback. Even that's not entirely accurate. What we need to really look at is on a case by case basis, what it means for the rest of our building. Are there significant savings in the mechanical systems that we can consider beyond baseline? What is the thermal comfort adjacent to that glass? Do we need heating right next to our glazing system to make it comfortable for, or cooling to make it uh, comfortable for the people right next to the glass? All of things should be considered in your LCA when evaluating the pros and cons. And when you think of the lifespan of this IGU, it's really not the glass that's the problem. It's the seals of the IGU itself. And those are getting like a 35 to 40 year lifespan of most modern IGUs. So we're still gonna be able to beat that 20 year payback. Um, other options that we can look at to try to get similar performance are the heat mirror products. Uh, something I must admit, I've shied away from a lot in the infancy of this uh, material, but it is getting better and better in terms of its uh, performance. And what you're seeing on this is that middle light of the triple glazed IGU is uh, actually a film that is tensioned across there to keep it transparent. And one of the challenges we had over the years is loss of tension along this film, creating a problem. Now this is something you could still start to see in like a structurally silicone glazed system or maybe a point supported system that we wouldn't advise. But if you're using it in a more captured frame uh, condition, you can see a little bit less embodied carbon for this uh, system while still getting that triple glaze performance. Um, and one thing I would encourage you to look into, I really don't have the time to get completely into, is enclose a study on what they call the Millennium IGU, which is really trying to address the lifespan of those primary seals on the IGU and using a combination of uh, the heat mirror style product with the ability to actually recharge insulated glass units to try to breathe new life into them as we get closer to that 35 to 40 year period and get these systems to last longer since the glass itself has a fairly long design life. And then as we look at our framing systems that go with our glazing, you know, when we look at our curtain wall, we're getting a great many things out of it, uh, the glass support, the thermal management, water management, air management, and of course structure. But most of the material, the embodied carbon that goes into these uh, curtain wall assemblies is actually just structure. So if we take that and just use the parts that we really care about, what we often in our office refer to as the intelligence, to deal with all those performance needs and deal with the structure in a different way, we can swap out that aluminum, which is a high embodied carbon material, for something else. And you know, we come into the idea of using uh, timber in that regard, using that what they call a veneer extrusion, or some of them refer to as add-on construction that's available from a great many manufacturers. We can put that on to, um, uh, engineered lumber. I mean, they're even making laminated bamboo that's used in many curtain walls, even unitized curtain walls in the system. One of the challenges we do run into with this uh, with some government agencies is procurement in that they want to see a store-bought system, like you buy a Colonel 1600 UT system or something like that. And we're usually dealing more with a kit of parts assembly in most of these and trying to get store-bought system that you have three bidders becomes a little bit more difficult. And then quite frankly, anytime you ask a glazer to operate in anything that's not aluminum, there's gonna be a little bit 
Um, and hopefully we'll have one of these in Boston in the near future is a project we're doing at the Dudley Library with the appeal. Um, other options we can use is uh, more efficient uh, structural members as far as the backup system using steel, which is three almost three times as rigid as aluminum. Many of these systems are governed by deflection to help manage the weather seals. So um, using steel is gonna be a little bit better than that. Um, we could also start to hang these systems, induce tension into them, make that material more efficient. And all of these things, we kind of make the systems do what they do best. And I'd like to close once again uh, with saving our buildings. When you start thinking of retrofits and biocarbon of the existing building, this uh, wonderful Darth Vader looking building leaks in every way imaginable, air, water, thermal. And what we're doing with it is we're actually saving all the uh, existing mullions and reglazing them by using what you see in yellow here is a fiberglass protrusion that we're gonna slide over the existing mullions and mount on new glazing. You get a high thermal performing system and reglazing the system. So we're able to save the imbibed carbon of the aluminum, but of course the glass is unfortunately a waste. And you can you see here some of the thermal diagrams. And then of course we don't need all glass and spandrel, so we're actually integrating a proper rain screen in many of the conditions using the aluminum as our framing system. Uh, to conclude, uh, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And really this is speaking to the LCAs and trying to balance our embodied carbon versus our operational carbon. What's the right payoff for our building? Um, generally more design in terms of really trying to optimize our materials. You know, less materials obviously gonna be less embodied carbon and how that weighs in holistically with the system. And for your architects, don't think you're in this on your own. You've got a team of enclosure, um, people involved in your project, consultants, experts, solid consultants, structural engineers, mechanical engineers that you should all engage to make them part of the solution. And with that, thanks, and I'll pass it on. Uh, sorry, I gotta get to the unshare. And it's not. All right, you should go. Great, thanks, Chris. All right, um, and that's actually a really great segue, I think, into the portion of the presentation I'm gonna give. Um, I set out with a, a peer of mine at Bruner Cott um, to kind of follow up on Carlo Fonte's uh, famous quote saying the greenest building is one that already exists. Um, and we in the, our office uh, have a really nice, I think, cross-section opportunity to work on buildings, uh, brand new uh, high performance projects, and also uh, what we like to call transformative reuse. And so we didn't really have a great comparable study to do, but uh, both George and I had just finished these two projects that were sort of off in either realm. And we decided to take a look at that and see what we could uh, try to compare between the two. Uh, the RW Curtin Center uh, was a, is a living building, um, and so I was thinking very much uh, about being a sustainable building, both uh, from an operations perspective and also from what it was being made out of. Um, and then the Mass Mocha Phase 3, uh, this is a real uh, reuse project where we were really uh, reusing what was there. Um, and as you can kind of see in this first slide of, of Mocha, um, you know, we are actually finding spaces that already exist and re-enclosing them. Um, and so a lot of it is already there. And so what we know based on some of the uh, recent presentations from this group is that if your envelope is already mostly there, if your structure is already mostly there, uh, we might actually be doing something really well already. And we wanted to try to study uh, what was the better thing to do. The slide on the right also starts to show the level to which the team uh, reused materials. So when they made new openings in these spaces, they actually salvaged the brick itself and reused it in other places. So really taking care, and this, this obviously is a very special project, um, but we thought it'd be an interesting one to start to study. On the flip side, uh, our living building uh, was trying to be very high performance, had a very super insulated envelope, um, and was trying to use biogenic or you know, materials that grow as much as possible to achieve both a low embodied carbon footprint, um, but also deal with materials toxicity um, as well. <clears throat> and so uh, when we first, started to look at this. Uh, we had just learned about Tally, um, which I believe somebody had just uh, put into the, the chat so you guys can all check that out. Um, and we're looking at this and we see that the reuse project has this huge embodied carbon footprint. What's going on with this? Um, uh, you know, it's a much bigger project, uh, 130,000 square feet compared to about 17,000. So we thought maybe this was right. 
Uh, then, of course, we realized we didn't know how to use the tool yet. And what we were looking at here was also including the operations of the project as well. Um, and so it's an important thing to think about. Catherine started to bring this up. There's an intrinsic connection between the two. Um, but we wanted to start to take a look at what these things were made out of. And what was really amazing was how little uh, over a square footage cost uh, the museum at MassMoca was using. Um, again, just reinforcing the idea that we were actually taking advantage of what was already there. Um, <clears throat> and so it made us think, well, how could we think a little bit better about this as we plan for our projects? We know how to tackle operational energy a little bit better. This is a slide that we used at Hampshire to try to illustrate some options that we could tackle and basically say, you know, how efficient could your building be if you're going to power it with the roof? Um, so if you have a very tall building, it has to be very efficient, low energy intensity, whereas if you have a single story sprawling building, just buy a lot of PV, you could power it. Um, and so how could we think about that from an embodied uh, perspective? And you guys have probably seen this slide. This is the one that did it for me that got me started and interested in this embodied carbon story. Uh, where, you know, as both Melanie and Catherine um, have indicated, there's a real, there's like a time sensitive issue here. Uh, we have a very short period of time to start to get this thing under control. And so when we look at that and we look at this, the, uh, the chart on the right, we start to realize that the green bar, what the buildings are made up of, may actually contribute a more significant amount of the carbon uh, than, the, than what those buildings will operate in over that time. And so we have to look at them. Um, together. And so, of course, if we consider the net zero building, we may have made a very big investment, um, but the operations will flatline, so it's not going to get any worse over time. Uh, whereas, you know, the reuse option may start very, very low, but it might be a very inefficient building. Um, and so the question is, you know, where is that trade off um, between the two? And we know that uh, we have this impending deadline. How do we make decisions? And of course, this study was trying to look at is there one um, better than the other? And of course, the answer is it sort of depends. Uh, what's been nice is that in the last uh, few years, we've started uh, further discussions with the uh, ILFI, which is the organization that managed the Living Building Challenge, and they have put forth the zero carbon certification. Um, and they thought about this a little bit similar to the way George and I were thinking about this. Um, where we're looking at both a, a, a metric to think about the operations of the building on a square footage basis and also thinking about uh, how much embodied carbon can we put into this building on a square foot basis too. Um, of course, if we go back and look at this, um, our new building, living building, just barely failed. So even though we took uh, a lot of care into what that building was made out of, we're, we're barely riding the edge of what a zero carbon building should be. And so that uh, made us want to think a little bit more carefully um, about what we're doing. Uh, on the flip side, we know that uh, the reuse building did a very good job, um, but we, wanted, we know that uh, it probably has some operational issues that we want to talk about. Um, so what, what's been really um, cool is that I think some folks in our office have started to think a little bit more uh, creatively about how do we actually deal with that um, from an existing building perspective. And so in Mass Mocha, we may have 130,000 square feet, um, and it's a museum space, which might make you think that the mechanical system has to work extra hard to keep the art cool and dry. Um, but the strategy here uh, was instead to build art galleries as buildings uh, sort of within the building. Um, and so on the left hand side, what you can see is that we have very special art that's kept at the very particular uh, humidity and temperature, whereas the, the rest of the building is allowed to sort of uh, mediate between that outside temperature and the inside and maybe flex a little past what we would define as an ASHRAE thermal comfort. Um, and so on the whole, we might actually still drive down some of those operational costs. Similarly, at Amherst College, we had the opportunity to work with an old McKim Mead and White building. Um, and it had been at the time uh, the powerhouse, I think, way long ago. They were using it as a garage, basically. Um, the school wanted this to be an event space, um, and so the use was somewhat infrequent, um, and the building uh, had a lot of character to it and the materiality, and so covering up the brick was a problem regardless of whether you're doing it on one side or the other. Um, and as Catherine started to discuss earlier, there's also a lot of, there are some moisture issues, and so there are some certain particular uh, installations you can actually use which turn out to be very intensive. Um, so in this case we thought well if the building is mostly not running at high capacity why don't we keep it uh, at a very sort of media you know allow that temperature to dip in and 
and spike, um, but that when it gets cold and we need to have people in the space, we'll just heat the occupants rather than thinking about heating the entire building. Uh, so again, just trying to balance uh, how much investment do we need and really thinking about what the operation of that space is. So once we had sort of taken a look at, you know, what did our reuse project, uh, how could we start to think more creatively about that, we decided, well, we also need to think a little bit about the fact that our living building did worse somehow on a building that was, uh, you know, less than one you know, 20th or something, the size of uh, the, the reuse project. And what was it that was really causing some of those issues? Um, so this is all uh, information that comes out of Tally that helps you understand based on what you've put into your Revit um, uh, model, uh, how much you know, embodied carbon is in the products that you've designed. Uh, what was cool is that the magenta stuff, the you know, thermal and moisture protection, where we thought you know, uh, this is usually where you see a big spike, uh, we did a pretty good job there. Um, but what we're seeing is actually surprising a little bit is that our cladding itself, uh, stone, uh, stone veneer, is really spiking. And so Chris, I think, mentioned a little bit about uh, why, that, why that might actually be the case. Um, and it makes sense based on the assembly that we had chosen. So essentially the entire backup of our wall, um, we thought ought to be made out of uh, as much as possible biogenic products. So in this case, mostly wood. Um, we're using a double stud cavity, we're filling it with cellulose, uh, we're using plywood, everything is FSC because the uh, living building challenge requires it. Um, and so the backup is actually doing a really good job. Um, but we need to get a little bit more critical in terms of what we're actually cladding these things with. In our case, we think we probably could drive down a little bit better. We had done some work with our contractor to find a local stone. Um, and so being local, um, not having to travel a long ways does help drive some of that down. Um, but also mixes of mortar and things like that would play in. And we'd really have to get a little more specific, I think, if we wanted to understand the true value of that. And in essence, uh, we want to think creatively, I think, and think about what are our options for cladding buildings as we move forward. And what we've found is that there's actually this really nice uh, symbiosis between thinking about uh, things that grow and, and the materials that we can use that come out of the earth. Um, there's a nice symbiosis between them being very low carbon, but also containing very little uh, toxic chemicals. And so as we move forward, um, we're starting to use that as our guidance uh, in terms of what it is that we're going to analyze um, to figure out what are the most appropriate things that we can clad with. Um, so we're looking at things that come from the earth, either those that grow out of the earth like wood um, or things that may actually just come out of the earth like, like slate, as you see on the left, um, terracotta. And again, what we're starting to learn, as Chris mentioned, is that it has a whole lot to do with the detailing and the support for how you put these things together. Um, that actually make uh, the biggest impact on this. So we're still learning, um, but the biggest thing that we've learned, I think, and the thing that you've heard from everybody is that uh, there, there is a balance, and a, I would pause it to say an entire budget, um, where we need to think about the performance of the walls that we're making, and also about the uh, embodied carbon that they are made uh, out of. So that's my portion. Thank you, everyone. Um, just gonna switch back to my screen. Excellent, and we will uh, dive into and I just wanted to say thank you again to all of our speakers for all that great information. And um, we will be posting the recording so you can all review all the information because we know it was pretty dense as well as the slides will be available later in case you missed that in the, um, the text. So please keep adding your Q&As, but we've got a couple we can start with. Um, so the first one is, um, I think Catherine, you can answer this one. It's, um, um, somebody had asked, what about um, polyiso's properties or how do they compare to other plastics? Like I'm assuming they mean the R value, like the embodied versus operational. That's my thought on the question. Poly, polyisocyanurate um, yeah. uh, is, is a R value, of, is one of the higher R values available. Uh, so that's uh, usually in the, in the mid, mid to highest 
uh, six R6 per inch range. Um, it's, uh, of course, a board form. So uh, that always means that you're going to be um, figuring out how to at attach it. And, uh, but you can a lot of times adhere it to something. Uh, and you also have to be careful about how it's going to uh, sit with the vapor. Um, so uh, there is, of course, a foil faced version that has, in effect, a, uh, a vapor barrier attached to it. In terms of a body carbon, it is um, not, it is blown, I believe it's uh, blown with pentane. Somebody should check me on that, but it is not blown with one of the super high, it's not blown with an HFC. So uh, uh, it is in the middle range as far as uh, embodied carbon is concerned. And um, it, uh, it actually is a, kind of a vapor retarder by itself, even without a, a foil facing on it. So uh, depending on the exact context in which you want to use it, it can be a very good material uh, to, to apply. And I use it a lot. <laughs> uh, great. And one more as well for you, Catherine. Sure. So, um, you had made a statement in the slide. Somebody said about mineral bat insulation. And somebody had missed that. I guess you had Oh, that, that, that there might be a problem with it. With it or mm -hmm. what's the problem with mineral wool kind of. OK, so yes. um, really, as with all, my, my overall point being with with all of these materials, uh, they are not bad. Mineral wool um, is uh, very versatile because uh, it's, all, it's produced in so many forms. And uh, but you have to understand how each of these forms work. And uh, what, you, what is consistent across the forms is um, is is the R value, which is always comes in at about four. Um, uh, that is four per inch. Um, what's not consistent uh, is, in fact, the embodied carbon, because um, the denser the material is, the more embodied carbon goes into it. Uh, and you also have to realize that this is uh, this uh, material is made by a very energy intensive process and it involves getting rock uh, <laughs> which ultimately can involve getting it out of the ground which is also a carbon emitting kind of thing to do so um, it is not necessarily low embodied carbon uh, at the best of times uh, and and it can actually get up there in terms of the amount of embodied carbon you're putting in when you're talking about a high density board um, mineral wool, as opposed to many of the plastics, uh, is not uh, going to be an air barrier um, or a, uh, or a, I'm sorry, a vapor barrier. Um, and you really have to be aware of that when you go and use it. Because, uh, for example, in an existing building, if you put mineral wool board or bat up against, say, a masonry, an existing masonry wall, uh, you need to make sure that your wall, that wall, that interior wall face is not going to uh, reach dew point because of the amount of humidity that is in the space at certain points and the change in temperature. You've got a cold wall, you've got some humidity on the inside, uh, it goes through there. That insulation is not stopping the humid air from getting there. And you also need to be aware of the humidity going through a masonry, uh, well, not humidity, but water, the saturation of rainwater through and migration through a masonry or concrete wall is also contributing to the potential humidity within your wall cavity. And your mineral wool insulation is not doing anything to impede that. So um, uh, you, you need to do your homework before you put the mineral wool on the existing wall or on any wall really <laughs> but i'm just giving that example great 
Uh, and we've got a question here that I'm going to direct to Christopher to start with. Um, someone's asking you to talk more about retrofits and are there buildings where the embodied carbon required to achieve good performance can't be paid back with the lowered operational emissions, for example, where the greener solution is to actually demolish and rebuild? Yeah. So our whole study actually built off on, I think, a much more elaborate study that looked at that exact question. And though um, I'll find a link and post it uh, in the chat after I speak. But the, essentially, the study decided to take a whole bunch of different original uses uh, for buildings, uh, structures, you know, storage, housing, uh, institutional, and things like that, and do a whole matrix of if you're starting in one use type um, and transitioning to another use type, and try to do a lot of data collection in terms of what does it cost to take it from one to the other and then how long does it actually take to pay back um, that use. And there are cases where the transformation from one type to another type does require so much uh, investment in, in salvage, you know, and able to salvage um, a structure that it just doesn't make sense and it doesn't pay back. Um, I will say it was not in all of them, and it was really mostly uh, functions that you would kind of have a gut feeling that wouldn't quite work out. You know, structural spacing isn't quite right or things like that. Like you don't have an envelope that's quite robust enough. You have to do a lot of work there to make it work. Um, but I think they did a very nice job of then giving at least this sort of guideline of, okay, here's the type of existing building that we have. Here's the use type that we want to transition it to. Is this a good um, use to say it? Now, that being said, uh, each project ends up being very specific. Um, so it would seem to me now that we have a, I think, deeper understanding of what materials value is, the carbon value is, um, to, to run that analysis. And I think some of the tools that we have today allow you to do a lot of that calculation, even at a very early level, uh, based on rough square footage numbers, or much more specifically to use a tool like Tally, for example, um, where you might actually have an existing model of the building and be able to run multiple scenarios to say, you know, is this worth saving or not? Because um, I think as we know, you know, again, the structure and the envelope seem to be really big targets for us. Um, having a little bit of information about how much uh, you would have to do to change them would help you to be able to make uh, that decision long term. Great. So we're going to do one more question. Also need to look though at what you're permitted to do. In other words, are you trying to get this building to perform by insulating all inboard or if you can go outboard of the insulation? I mean, historically listed buildings are harder to get to perform at a higher level, whereas a lot of these um, mass masonry buildings, if you can insulate the outside and activate all that embodied, right. uh, sorry, not embodied, uh, mass, thermal mass to your advantage, it can be very helpful. That's great. Uh, one more question uh, before we do some wrap up and then we'll address all the rest of the questions. Um, we'll stay on a little longer if anybody would like to listen, if we missed your question. Um, so Chris, I'm going to direct this one to you. Um, so somebody is asking if you are aware of the embodied carbon studies of the different types of steel um, and how that affects the envelope system, like for example, which steel mill it comes from and if it's what type of uh, electricity or fossil fuels or electric arc furnace. I don't actually have an answer for that on the light gauge. I mean, I know the carbon steel was covered pretty well in the last lecture as far as, you know, tube shapes being the worst, plate in the middle and rolled sections um, as being the least carbon intensive. But I do know that the um, light gauge is using considerably less heat to be made than hot rolled steel hence the name of cold form steel. But, uh, I'd have to get back to you on exact data. I must admit I've been cheating and just using tally to tell me the answer <laughs> when we go through that. <laughs> but um, it is definitely not as heat intensive a process as hot rolled steel. Great. Um, so we'll come back to the rest of the questions. I just uh, want to once again, thank our sponsors and our partners. And I want to remind all of you again to just please enter your name, email, address, and your AAA number if you want to receive continuing education in the um, Google Doc that is in the chat box. There's a link. And don't forget that next week we have we continue the session with the M on MEP, and we've got this stellar lineup of speakers, so be sure not to miss it and we will be sharing a recording of this session. 
and we'll share it with you all uh, email pretty shortly. So thank you all for joining and thank you again to our panelists. Go back to the Q and A's for anybody who wants to stick on a few minutes longer. Um, Somebody had asked about 1970s buildings um, that are uh, full of hazardous materials and does it make sense to save some of those um, for the intrinsic value? So I think Christopher, if you want to maybe address that about renovations. Yeah, we've run into this uh, in some of our renovations of buildings, oftentimes with um, PCBs and things that are in sealants. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, it, it sort of depends. Um, depends how pervasive it is. It depends what the interior finish is going to be. Uh, there are cases where removal is really the only solution to provide uh, for safety. There's other cases where encapsulation uh, is a technique that we've used. Um, so it's really going to depend on what that toxin is. It's going to depend on how pervasive it is, how dangerous it is, um, and what the, the you know, goal is for the final finish. Um, as Chris mentioned, are you allowed to uh, encapsulate it on one side and safely do so? Um, do you need to remove it anyways? Um, it's it, it totally uh, ends up depending on what your end goal uh, for the project is. Um, and I will say that it, it again just want to drive home like one of the th things that I think was the most interesting through our uh, exercise with the living building was just the that sort of um, you know the the crossover in the Venn diagram of, of low carbon products. Um, and healthy products, um, you know, it doesn't answer the retrofit question necessarily, but, um, you know, we, we definitely find that uh, when we're choosing the natural material, um, that we find those both benefits happen together. And so, you know, one of the things to keep thinking about here too is at some point there will be an end of life um, and trying not to make those kinds of uh, toxic situations so that the buildings that we build today, when they get renovated, won't have to make those same kind of decisions. Great. And then there is one other question that came in through the chat box. Uh, I'm going to direct this to Chris. Um, someone was asking about thermal break materials and methods and products um, that are used to provide the, um, the, for the continuous insulation and which ones provide the best performance, the lowest cost, and I'm going to add lowest embodied carbon. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer that hits the nexus of all of them. Uh, one of my preferred uh, store bots is using the smart CI intermittently and a lot of that actually has to do uh, with the cost and that I can get the, the labor to be considerably easier because of what it means to screw those in. Um, I also like the Cascadia clips a lot. Those are both fiber reinforced polymer based ones. I think you'll find with the different thermal break technologies, you really got to be looking at your um, your system U value that you're able to calculate, whereas a lot of them, like say a night wall, that are much better than the alternative where they're more just a, a thermal shim, basically um, offsetting a steel member, don't uh, generally work nearly as well as some of the all polymer based ones. There are a few projects that are coming out or a few custom systems are coming out that are um, more like poured into bridged uh, systems with aluminum on the inside and out and aluminum sounds absolutely horrible and bad, but these uh, port into bridge systems are actually performing really quite well. And we see that on a lot of our panelized jobs, like the MIT project had the, uh, the port into bridge Z's on all our mega panels on that project, whereas the stick built systems use more of a night wall on those. Um, trying to think if there are any others. I mean, there's also the ability to build some of these just um, out of stock pieces from like a company like Strongwell, where they just uh, pull shrewd fiber reinforced polymers. We use those quite a bit for our more custom systems that don't fit the, um, the perfect box of a store-bought system. I think the other thing to think about with them is really trying to control where your dead load and wind load is being used, where some of these uh, rain screen thermal brake technologies work just fine for wind, but um, especially when you get into a heavier cladding like stone or terracotta don't work as well, where maybe use a more robust uh, thermal brake system like a Fabrica pad to support a um, more of a ledger condition to take all the dead load. And then you can use a much cheaper, lighter system for your wind load conditions. Mm 
Yeah, I, I might actually add on to that too. Mm -hmm. Like, I think this whole situation of what the backup is is a really interesting one. The conversations that I've been having recently is also that you have to consider the end of life of all those materials as well. Right. And so the thing that's been sort of interesting, it's like, it depends, like, where do you set your boundaries? And I know this is like a one on one course, but it really, really starts to change the game when you say that, because if you think about some of these aluminum and steel backups, if they are ultimately recyclable, they may have the ability to become used again without the same amount of energies it would take to start over with raw uh, mined material. And so the thing that I always sort of feel skeptical about, and this is, of course, because of my, you know, tumultuous experience having dealt with the red list and the ILFI is like, think, what are these products? What are they actually made out of? What happens to them when the building is all done? And I know we're dealing with the next 10 years and that's really the crisis, but it always is in the back of my mind thinking of, you know, what, what are we making it out of? Is it simple enough to be deconstructible? Can it then become another product again? And should we be thinking about the boundary at that point? And of course it depends. And uh, it's all gonna change depending on what your, your boundaries are and what your goals are in the project. Yeah, so that's where like drop and lock rain screen style systems work really well in that they also give the ability to maintain your, your membranes afterward, where a lot of these cladding systems, you can paint yourself in a corner really quick and have to deconstruct <laughs> the whole building to get in there and do a repair, where as long as you're not in a high seismic zone, like it won't work in LA or San Francisco, but um, you can actually use gravity to hold the panels in place and therefore have less hard fasteners and then what that enables you to do is make these panels span floor to floor which means you need less penetrations through your envelope therefore less thermal bridging less waterproofing concerns and then when you need to come and maintain you can just lift the whole panel off do your repair put the panel back or put it on a new building yeah there's clearly a lot of details and nuance with envelopes um, but i don't see any other questions coming in but feel free to reach out to any of us with your questions in the future. We would be happy to answer them. I'm just gonna stop sharing and just say one more thank you to everybody. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, thanks. 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 <laughs>